Thank you, Dr. McAllister, and thank you, everyone. It's always uh, an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to present uh, at the AEP. The topic of my presentation this morning is practical applications of growth factors and, and cell-based therapies. You know, if you have attended any of the lectures at all during this Congress, you know that in a very predictable way through traditional periodontal plastic surgery, we can increase keratinized tissue, we can cover denuded root surfaces, with less predictability we can augment papilla, and rarely we can achieve regeneration. I'd like to share with you projects that we're accomplishing at our center utilizing tissue engineering to accomplish all of these objectives, but to accomplish them without a donor site, with reduced morbidity, and with an unlimited amount of donor material, with increased predictability, more robust results, and a more natural outcome. It's important that I disclose that the following companies have funded the research you're about to see, Organogenesis, Isologen, OsteoHealth, and Geislick Pharma, but I always maintain complete control of reporting of data and content of my lectures. You know, tissue engineering brings together the power of modern physical, chemical, and biologic sciences, and it represents a spectrum of novel approaches to achieve regeneration. I like to think of tissue engineering as a broad matrix. In the center of this matrix, we have biologically based devices. These are biocompatible substrates that either through physical or chemical signals can direct cellular growth. On the other end of the tissue engineering matrix, we have bioactive molecular based devices. Here the theory is, is that if you and I can identify the appropriate biologically active molecule, if we can deliver it to the site at the appropriate concentration, at the appropriate, for the appropriate time, that, that these, these molecules then cause cells from the periphery of the defect to migrate in, to differentiate, to proliferate, and finally to participate in the regenerative process. On the opposite end of the tissue engineering matrix, we have live cell based devices. These devices bring with them cells, cytokines, collagens, all sorts of things that we need for regeneration. And I'd like to share with you studies that we've done recently using all three areas of the tissue engineering matrix. Let's begin with the center, the biologically based devices. I have a little confession here. I've kind of avoided this area over the past, and I've avoided it because I thought it was the boring part of tissue engineering. You know, to me, in the past, I thought of biologically based devices as these inert scaffolds that don't really do too much, or, or these membranes that just kind of sit there, might maybe guide a little cellular growth. And, and in fact, you know, they only carry the exciting stuff. They carry the bioactive molecules, they carry the cells, and, and it seems that many of them actually get in the way of regeneration. I'm now finding that's not necessarily true if you choose the right membrane. In fact, if we look at the state of the art as, as stated by Stephen Babalock, he's a, a, one of the really leaders in tissue engineering um, scaffolding. He states that biologic scaffolds composed of extracellular matrix have been shown to markedly affect angiogenesis, cell proliferation, migration, differentiation through cell signaling mechanisms. These scaffolds have been shown to be rich in growth factors and various types of collagen. And more recently, degradation products of the parent ECM molecules have been shown to have significant biological activities themselves. From this perspective, degradable biological scaffolds may be considered control release devices for a, for a variety of functional molecules. So today, if you pick the right scaffold, it's not your dad's old Oldsmobile. You know, there, there are lots of these membranes and, and scaffolds that, that really don't add much to the mix, but there are some that can really move the entire process toward, uh, from re repair toward regeneration. And the one we've been doing research on over the last few years is a xenogenic collagen matrix. When you look at it, you immediately see there's something very different about this matrix than the ones you're typically using. Uh, you see that, that it has two layers. It has a cell occlusive outer layer. It's got a soft sponge inner layer. It's made of porcine collagens one and three. And if you look at a high power a photograph of it, you can clearly see the two distinct areas. It has this, this protective reinforcing area of collagen one fibers, and then it has this inner layer of both intact and fragmented collagen fibers. And I'll get back to in just a, in mo a moment the importance of the fragmented collagen fibers. But it's really the marrying of these two, the reinforcing matrix and the cell signaling source for regenerative wound healing that's important. Because when you look at this initially, you're really looking at the macrostructure, and you're, you're 
thinking that's the unique part. And it is unique. It's, it's much thicker, and it, it does stabilize the cells. But it's the, the microstructure that makes it unique because the body recognizes collagen 1 as normal. But these, this, this inner layer that has both the fragmented and the intact collagen fibers, with the fragmented collagen fibers, what happens? It allows the, the collagen helixes to unwind. And as these collagen helix unwind, they expose what would be hidden or cryptid amino acid sequences, such as RDG and other sequences that we know are important for regeneration. To give you an example of how we've been using this, this is a, an interesting example just to show how it works in an exposed environment and how impressed I was with wound healing on this. I was waiting with this patient, uh, we had done an implant posteriorly here, we're waiting on that to integrate and she said, you know Mike, I don't like this pigmentation that's between my teeth and, and she said, can you do something about that? And typically I would manage this with a, a graft from the palate and, and you could do that, but it's going to be challenging because it goes into the papillary region also there's pigmentation right at the free gingival margin. So, you know, I'm concerned about uh, recession and all those kind of things. And if I'm taking tissue from the palate, while I might be able to do a tissue replacement graft, likely I'm going to see soft tissue uh, changes as far as color and texture. Uh, so I remove the pigmentation. I just use it as a, a pattern on the, the matrix, and I suture it to, to the, ba excuse me, the boundary of the matrix. And I draw your attention to wound healing at one week. Look how little inflammation there is at one week and how it appears we're maintaining tissue volume. Here we are at four weeks and at uh, a smile at four weeks, very rapid healing, and we're, we're, not, we're not seeing the borders that I would see as far as if I were using connected tissue grafts. So the material is unique in that it works in an exposed environment, an open environment, and then we did our RCT with it under a flap. And we compared it with the connected tissue graft, the, which is, of course, the, the gold standard for root coverage, and we placed a currently advanced flap over the material. It's a 25 patient study. Uh, we looked at it initially at six months, then at 12 months, and we're now looking at 24 month data. This was published, if you have an interest to really get into it, a couple of months ago in Journal of Periodontology. Our primary efficacy parameter was recession depth, and we looked at a whole host of secondary efficacy parameters. Just to give you a feel for the type of surgery we did, you had to have at least three millimeters of recession to get into the study. We mark the CEJ just for photographic purposes so it's easy to see. Partial thickness flap, intraoperative measurements. I um, am suturing the, the matrix to the papilla here, currently advanced the flap, and at one year we have 100% root coverage, a nice aesthetic result. So when we looked at our data at, at one year, we found there were only two parameters that there was any statistically significant difference, and that was recession depth and percent root coverage. And of course, that's the same data, it's just a different way of expressing it. So when we looked at connected tissue graph versus our currently advanced flap with the matrix, these were the only two variables that had any statistical differences. And what we found was that our connected tissue graft, we achieved 99% root coverage. And if we look at the xenogenic collagen matrix, we achieved 88.5% root coverage. And a surprise with this was that we actually generated more keratinized tissue with this matrix than we did connected tissue. Unless I'm mistaken, I, I think this is the only RCT in which connected tissue graft is the control where the test actually generated more keratinized tissue than did the connected tissue graft itself. So our conclusions with this is that we're getting percent, the, the percent root coverage and the percent of sites achieving 100% root coverage utilizing this material are in upper limits of expected range if you look at meta-analysis, systematic reviews, but we're doing that with less morbidity, less technique sensitive, and better aesthetics. It has certainly the potential to reduce under treatment because if I'm doing connected tissues from the graft, I mean from the palate, oftentimes I'm forced to only treat those areas in greatest need because of the limited amount of donor material. We have an increased amount of keratinized tissue over connected tissue graft. We're beginning a study to evaluate it uh, uh, to look at increasing keratinized tissue around teeth. And it may be a good carrier for, uh, for other agents. Again, as you look at lots of biologically active agents, oftentimes the, the scaffold is, is a problem. And we need to look more at a release and, and uh, binding kinetics, but uh, it may be a good carrier for other agents. Well, let's move from the center here then 
over to the live cell end of the tissue engineering matrix. I think this is an exciting area. I, I think all these areas are exciting. It's a great time to be a paradise. But living cells, the, the, these live cell-based devices bring with them lots more than just the cells. They're, of course, bringing with them cytokines. They're bringing with them collagen. They're bringing with them glycaminoglycans. But theoretically, the most exciting thing that these li live cell devices can do is they can deliver these products on demand. Because, you know, what's one of the problems we have with biologically active molecules? We can identify one that we know is robust, but oftentimes we don't get the result we want. And why is that? Well, did it really get to where we wanted it to? Did it stay there long enough? Maybe it was there too long. Was it viable when it was there? These cells, they're living. They have little surface receptors on them, and they're talking to each other, and they're talking to the native environment. And theoretically, they have the potential then to titrate exactly the amount of cytokines and other things that are necessary to move toward regeneration. Now, anytime you and I are faced with an oral mucosal defect, we've got a couple different surgical strategies that we can use to manage that. Today, we usually look for a procedure that results in primary intention. You know, we're going to mobilize a flap and we're going to suture it or we're going to harvest a graft and close it with a graft. Or we may choose to, to, to choose a procedure that results in secondary intention. You know, in periodontics, we used to do the pushback procedure. Today, procedures that result in secondary intention have kind of fallen out of favor because of the time that it takes, because of the morbidity, the inflammation. But the truth is, even with procedures with primary intention, you can get a scar as you, as you mobilize the flap and sutured, or you may get a tissue mismatch with the graft. And no matter whether you're working with procedures that are revolving around primary intention or secondary intention, they both fall on a spectrum of wound healing. On one end, we've got you know, a keloid, we've got a hypertrophic scar, uh, maybe we have a, a tissue mismatch from the paddle tissue that we placed here. We know that kids heal uh, faster than adults, we know that fetuses heal without a scar, and we know that certain animals like newts and salamanders will regenerate entire appendages through enhanced forms of secondary intention. So our job as scientists and as clinicians is to try to find procedures that will allow us to move from the scar end of the spectrum to the regenerative end of the spectrum. Arnold Kaplan is, is a, one of the tissue engineering gurus in, in mesenchymal stem cell research. And Dr. Kaplan really believes that all of us have a little bit of nude in us. And, and he, he reminds us that, for example, there's, there's, and there's a number of these examples in the literature, but there, there's a report of a little kid in, in England. He three, was three years old. His finger was cut off in an accident, and he was in a remote area. He couldn't get to a hospital. All they could do was to keep that area clean and bandaged it, and he regenerated an entire digit. So while you and I may think of secondary intention as being the old crude way of doing things, I want to remind you that if you look at any regenerative model, be it animal, neonatal, neonatal or fetal, they all operate on the level of enhanced secondary intention. And if you, put a, if you think, well, I'm going to help this old nude out here, and I'm going to put a suture in this limb bud, the limb bud doesn't grow back. You know, you've got to leave this alone. So, so Dr. Kaplan believes that all of us have great d uh, potential for regeneration. We just need a little boost. With him, he's working with, with mesenchymal stem cells, and he creates an, a, a, a microenvironment for regeneration. The material that we're using to, to give the body a little bit of boost is a living cellular construct. Now, you have to kind of change the way you think about these things because this doesn't operate like a graft. Cells that come in from a graft, those cells stay there. They retain their phenotype. There's, of course, problems with uh, a, a limitation of donor material. There's, the, there's problems with morbidity. But one of the problems you don't think of is that there is certainly certain evidence that if you cr close a defect prematurely with a graft, you can actually abrogate the body's innate ability to regenerate. So here the material is, here's the LCC that applied to this, this uh, defect, and, and, and at three weeks you can see how it's beginning to heal. Now if we had put a, um, a skin graft here, you would always see the border of that skin graft. You may, not, may be able to get it to close, but I draw your attention to six, at six months, not only is this closed, but also you have return of natural pigmentation. And that's because it's not working as a graft, it's working through enhancing the healing through secondary intention, moving that down the spectrum of wound healing.
We're doing the same thing in the, in the oral environment. This is one of our patients from the pivotal trial. You can, I think, appreciate this as just mucosa here. We're not going to try to cover the root surface, just add in keratinized tissue. Now, I, I've created my bed. If we were just placing this material and it was going to act like a, a biologically active Band-Aid, then we would just get faster healing without a scar but end up with the same tissue we started. But this material doesn't work like that. Here we placed it on, and what it does is it actually changes the trajectory of healing. It allows us to, to end up with site-appropriate differentiation of the cells that belong there. So instead of having mucosal cells, we now have a nice functional band of keratinized tissue. These cells uh, uh, come from neonatal fibroblasts and neonatal keratinocytes, and they bring with them a whole host of cytokines. I've highlighted just the ones that, that we already know that are important in periodontal regeneration. BMPs, fibroblast growth factors, PDGF, TGF beta 1, VEGF, we know these are important. One of the difficulties we have is how do we get those? This material potentially will act as a reservoir for these cytokines that we know are important, and again, theoretically may be able to, to deliver those important growth factors on demand. Now this is in vitro gene expression, but you can see that certain of these cytokines are actually elevated, the production is elevated after application, and that's because it's interacting with the host. You need a little more of this, here it comes. You got enough? Okay, we'll shut that down. So, so theoretically, the potential here is very exciting. And of course it brings with it all the extracellular matrix components that are important as well. So we used this material in a, in a study we published in Journal of Periodontology, a, a pilot paper uh, that was published a couple of years ago where we were using the control as a free gingival graft. To be honest, the free gingival graft isn't a good control. This is, don't, you can't think of this as a graft. So a better control would have been a pushback, but you can't get that through an IRB. And if you look at, at uh, what we achieved as far as keratinized tissue, yes, the, the free gingival graft generated about twice as much keratinized tissue, but we, were, we generated 2.5 millimeters of keratinized tissue without a donor site, which I think is pretty outstanding. And if you look at aesthetics, the, the LCC comes out far superior, much better color match, much better texture match, and that's again because it's not acting like a graft. It doesn't retain those paddle phenotypes. And with that positive information, we then rolled that into a large multi-center trial. We have four centers, our center in Houston, uh, University of Texas San Antonio with Drs. Cochran and Melanie, Michigan with Dr. Giannobli and his group, and Mark Nevins in Boston in his office. It was a 96 patient uh, pivotal trial, six months. Our primary efficacy parameter was uh, to achieve greater than or equal to two excuse me, two millimeters of keratinized tissue, and you can see we had a host of secondary and tertiary endpoints. We, we elected both in the pilot and the pivotal trial to use three layers of this material. So we, it's a Z-fold, and the keratinocytes are on the outside, the fibroblasts are on the inside, and on the pilot study we also placed a fourth layer uh, just to cover that and to, to act as a buffer from the copac that we placed over it. In the, in the, the uh, pivotal trial, we also quit uh, standardizing the width of the LCC versus the free gingival graft because again it's not a graft so it doesn't make sense to do that so we basically tried to put as much of it as we could uh, basically whatever the vestibule, vestibule would allow. So I think you can appreciate here just mucosa here's the LCC the free gingival graft and you see we're getting a very similar amount of keratinized tissue with both and the last one I'll show you again purely mucosa purely mucosa and yes, that's what we were all trained that a free gingival graft looks like. But I draw your attention to this. Nice functional zone of a tas gingiva. You can't tell that I was ever in there. And I think that's where we're going today. With our techniques, we know that we can predictably generate keratinized tissue. We want to take it to the next step so that we can create tissue that's identical to what Mother Nature intended. And this type of surgery and this type of technique will allow us to do that. So in the pivotal trial, we moved with our techniques improved and we moved from 2.5 millimeters of keratinized tissue in the pilot to a mean of 3.21 millimeters of keratinized tissue in the pivotal. And how much keratinized tissue do you need? I think that's probably enough. And again, our aesthetic outcomes highly in favor of uh, both in color and texture because it's not a graft. 
So the conclusion of this was that LCC is effective and well tolerated in a non-submerged healing environment, both with the pilot and the pivotal. It generates more than three millimeters of keratinized tissue, provides improved aesthetics, greater patient preference, and no donor site morbidity. And this product is now uh, with the FDA for evaluation. Before we leave the, the live cell end, I also want to briefly go over uh, uh, RCT we did a couple of years ago, utilizing the patient's cells to augment papillas. You know, this is the only area that traditional periodontal plastic surgery uh, still is, is lacking about uh, giving us something to be able to handle predictably. And, and to my knowledge, this is the only RCT uh, where anybody's tried to augment papillas. Everything else are, are, are case series, which are, are case reports, which are important, but they don't really tell us in much about predictability. So here we're taking a small uh, sample of the patient's tissue from the palate. We're sending it <clears throat> to the laboratory. The laboratory breaks out the different cells. We're growing out uh, the fibroblast to 200 million fibroblasts per ml. These fibroblasts are then put into an injectable medium and then we inject those fibroblasts into the deficient papilla. Now we're not injecting collagen, this isn't a filler, we're injecting living cells that then have the potential not only to, to maintain the result, but maybe even uh, improve the result over time. And again, uh, the fibroblasts do a lot more than just produce collagen. They're important for cell proliferation, extracellular matrix production, growth factor production, collagen production. So here I have my magic potion here. Again, this isn't collagen. This, this is a solution of 99.9% .9 pure fibroblasts. And I'm going to inject and plump out this papilla, right? Probably not. This material was used uh, initially to uh, plump out skin lines and smile wrinkles. And you know, you can imagine with your, your face, you could do that. But all of you have injected local anesthetic in papilla. You know you're not gonna plump that out. We knew that, of course, so we developed what we termed the papilla priming procedure, just a, a controlled surgical insult so that we end up with swelling. So at three days, you see that uh, it's swollen above baseline. At seven days, it's not quite so acute, but still swollen by 21 days, all the swelling's gone. Well, how can we leverage this to our advantage? Well, we chose to, to go in at seven days, at five to seven days, and inject either with placebo or with 200 million fibroblasts per ml. And I chose seven days because if you remember back to the, the wound healing cycle, at about seven days, you're moving from the inflammatory part of the wound healing cycle to the granulation tissue formation phase. The body says, okay, fibroblasts, we're shutting down, collagen accumulation is waning, you're beginning to move into the, into the wound contraction. So I wanna boost that. If the body's shutting down its own fibroblasts, I want to hit it with more, and we did that in three doses every seven days. Now, we measured this in a lot of ways, but the way that was most uh, uh, sensitive was through digital uh, uh, photo photographs. On the y-axis, this is open interproximal space, so on the top of the y-axis is an open interproximal space, on the bottom is closed, and these are just time points. So this is a papilla priming, okay? So we do our little surgery, and this is swelling, okay? So it's closing down just from swelling. This is our first injection of fibroblast, second injection of fibroblast, third injection of fibroblast. Now, if we were just, just injecting a filler, this is all you're gonna get, right? But look, even though we didn't inject any more, the open interproximal space closed. How's that possible? It's possible because those fibroblasts are taking up their natural uh, uh, structure in the, in the dermis, they're producing collagen, they're thickening the dermis, and, and, uh, uh, and, and maintaining the result over time. I want everybody to look at the center. I'll show you uh, a time lapse of one of our patients. You know, you, you can do anything with computers, but nothing's altered here. So look at the center here. So we know from this project that uh, we certainly can do this kind of thing. Uh, we know that autologous fibroblasts are safe and may be efficacious for the treatment of open interproximal spaces. Our study showed that investigators and subjects' visual analog scale assessment of test sites were superior to placebo. Our, endpoint, our objective endpoints failed to demonstrate statistical significance, but further studies are needed with more appropriate power and more sensitive measurement techniques to really look at that. So here is this patient that I'm injecting. At this point, I didn't know whether this was a placebo or it was a cells. Uh, after the study's over, I find out this, these are cells, so you'll see it blanching. Uh, we're injecting anywhere from four to six million fibroblasts per 
uh, papilla. So here it is at day zero. Here we are at four months, clearly improvement. This patient is still in my practice. She was in my office about a month ago on maintenance, and I want you to look at uh, the change we now have at around five years. So it continues to, to improve. These fibroblasts are, are still doing their job, and again, theoretically, it's possible they can continue to close it down to the limits of the embrasure. So let's move now from the live cell end to the bi biologically active molecular end of the tissue engineering matrix, and let's spend the rest of the time talking about studies that we've recently done using recombinant PDGF. We published two papers last year in the Journal of Periodontology, one in Journal of Periodontology, one in the International Journal of Restorative Dentistry. One paper centered around uh, uh, clinical parameters and the other around histologic parameters, comparing the connected tissue graft to the coronally advanced flap with uh, a platelet-derived growth factor and TCP. Uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Schupach uh, did a fabulous job with the histology, very you know, world-class uh, histology. This is a 30-patient study, six months. Uh, primary accuracy parameter was change in recession depth. Secondary, uh, you can see on the screen. And at six months, these were the ones that we had statistical significance between. We had change in recession depth, percent root coverage, which again, the same data just expressed in a different way, and pain and discomfort was significant between the two procedures as well. The results were that we achieved 91% root coverage with our coronally advanced flap with a PDGF, and we achieved 98% uh, root coverage with the connected tissue. Again, if you look back at systematic reviews, both of these are higher than you would expect. It, most systematic reviews are going to suggest that in Miller class 1 and 2 recession, you're going to achieve around 89% root coverage, and most systematic reviews would tell you if you're using just a coronally advanced flap, that you're going to get about 82% root coverage. So as a clinician, I always want to know what's the added value, what am I paying for? Clearly to me, there's, there's some added value here to placing something under that connected tissue flap. So here is, uh, again, we've marked the CEJ with a pencil, uh, three millimeters recession. In this case, we're doing full thickness flap, not partial, because I'm going to try to grow bone over that root surface as well. I've already done my root planning and biomodification. I'm placing a little uh, PDGF on the root surface. We've already hydrated the TCP, and I'm placing that now over the root surface. I just want a little bit of this. Don't put a big blob of this. You just want enough to keep the, the flap from collapsing down on the root surface so that you have room for regeneration. And we're not placing a, a cell occlusive membrane on this. We're placing just a collagen wound dressing. With most biologics, you don't want to use a cell occlusive membrane. So this is, this is just a, a, a uh, a collagen membrane that, that's going to go away very quickly. I'm hydrating it with the, the PDGF. Now it's hydrated. We advance the flap. And here's what we have at six months comparing to what we had initially and comparing to the opposite side with the connected tissue. So a very equivalent result to, to our connected tissue control. Now anytime you and I are covering root surfaces, we've got three goals that we want to try to achieve. The first is we want to, to restore the, pro, the, the protective functional morphology, okay? Second is we want to create an aesthetic environment. And I think I've shown you that we've been able to achieve both of those goals with the coronally advanced flap with the PDGF and the connected tissue. It is the third goal in, in treating recession defects that we had clear and distinct differences between test and control, and that's regeneration of the lost attachment apparatus, regenerating new bone, functionally oriented uh, periodontal ligament, and cementum. So this is what we reported in the International Journal of uh, Perry and Restorative Dentistry as well as, as JP. Now, I created a, a protocol in which we recruited two patients that needed orthodontic therapy. One patient needed two bicuspids extracted, the other needed uh, uh, one bicuspid, uh, four bicuspids extracted. So we had six teeth, and that allowed us to go in, at the six teeth for extraction. We went in, we created surgical defects, we allowed them to become chronic, we randomized them, and we grafted them either with connected tissue or with PDGF. We allowed it to heal for nine months, and then I came in and removed the tooth and block. Then the patient went into orthodontic movement, a nice ethical way to get human histology. On all six teeth, we, they all achieved 100% root coverage, but neither of the connected tissue grafts showed any regeneration, and four of four of the teeth with the PDGF showed regeneration. 
to give you a feel of what we, we were looking at, this uh, little uh, reference mark that I made with a high-speed finishing burr indicates where the original free gingival margin was. Here's a reference mark of the osseous crest. I've grafted it. We remove it at uh, nine months. You see we have 100% root coverage. Everybody put on your Superman x-ray vision and look through this, and what are you going to see? What you see is this, and this is, is our micro CT of this. Here you're seeing the notch at the, the free gingival margin. You can't see the notch at the alveolar crest because you have all this bone that's grown over it. So, so seeing this bone growing up was exciting, but I have to admit that I thought, you know, why didn't I get more? And this next part isn't in the manuscript because honestly I had to lecture on this probably a dozen times before it dawned on me that we're, we regenerated as much bone as, 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 is, as is possible. This is a ground section of this tooth. It's such pretty histology, it looks like an illustration. But if you cut this tooth right there and look at it histologically, here's our sulcus, here's our lung junctional epithelium ending at the gingival notch, our connective tissue attachment. So this is our biologic width. So we regenerated bone as high up as we could. It's, it's, it's physiologically impossible to generate any more bone because we've got to have room for the attachment apparatus. And when you look at the bone we did regenerate here, I draw your attention to the old cementum, new cementum, functionally oriented PDL, look at the Sharpies fibers, new bone. Another patient I'm marking at the free gingival margin, mark at the osseous crest. Here's our graft, we remove the tooth in block at nine months, and again, look at the bone that's grown over the root surface, and if you look at the pre-op, we have, have grown bone to the limits of the biologic width. And we're not talking about a little bone. Again, if you go back to the literature, and what's the literature on human histology on root coverage over denuded roots, most of the studies, they either say they got regeneration or they didn't. They don't talk about quantitatively how much, and most that do talk about it, they're looking at the 0.5 to 1 millimeter range. We're growing 2 to 3 millimeters of bone here. So we're talking about a significant amount of bone. Clear distinction between the old bone here and new bone. You can see the, the osteocytes, the uh, Sharpies fibers, the cementocytes, the new acellular, the new cellular cementum, the old cementum, and if you look with polarizing light microscopy, here's your dentin, your old cementum, new cementum, Sharpies fibers, functionally ordered in PDL, and new bone. Everything you need for true periodontal regeneration. Compare this then to the control. Here again, we've got our, our mark at the free gingival margin, our mark at the osseous crest, 100% root coverage. But I draw your attention to look at the 100% root coverage, but put your x-ray vision on. Do you have anything there? And look at this. For the first time, here's my notch at the osseous crest. Here's the notch here. This looks exactly like it looked the day we did it. Not one thing happened. Now, this is, I'm a clinician, I'll take this result. Our long junctional epithelium ends here. It's all connected tissue there. It's a nice result, but is it regeneration? No. The last slide I'll show you is that prior to doing this study, we had to do a pilot study. And so we did uh, a pilot study, and these are just two, two of the patients that we published in the International Journal of, of Peri and Restorative Dentistry for the pilot study. This particular patient came back to me three years later. So it gave me an opportunity to say, okay, well, uh, nice aesthetics, we're maintaining uh, our root coverage. He has a periodontal abscess on the first molar, and he gave me permission to do a little peekaboo. And what we find is at three years, we've got a gain of three millimeters of supporting bone, and this is in a naturally occurring defect where the ones I showed you before were surgically created. So I hope you share my enthusiasm that uh, there's never been a better time to be a periodontist or a patient in need of our services. We're going to be able to provide for our patients more robust therapy, and do it in a way that's much more predictable and less evasive. I thank you very much for your attention, and I'll